Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Sister Power. Today, our topic, justice discrepancies. And we're going to jump right into our hot topics. And, and our hot topics for this episode, we're going to talk about justice for Ladani Miani, critical race theory, and voter suppression. And we are so fortunate to have uh, voices from our Hawaii attorneys, and we have uh, our co-host Sequoia Carr Brown, um, who is uh, director and founder of Strange Fruit. And we're going to start with you, Bridget uh, Bickerton. You are the attorney for the Ladani Miani family. Am I correct? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you just briefly give us an update where we stand now? Where is the we want justice for the, the uh, Miani family. And, and first of all, we would like to send our heartfelt um, condolences and sympathies to the Miani family. So just exactly mm -hmm. where we are today. Well, um, we are in the midst of the civil lawsuit. We had a very, very disappointing decision by the prosecutor, uh, Steve Alm, to not prosecute the officers who were involved in the shooting and who shot and killed Lindani Miani. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of problems with his analysis. And, um, you know, I think, I think that those will come out, the specific problems and the specific factual inaccuracies. Um, but right now we're focused on pressing the civil lawsuit and obtaining further discovery and um, moving toward the yeah, trial in the case and getting, getting justice uh, to the extent that justice can be served through the civil lawsuit. Uh, we do believe that the officers should be prosecuted and um, unfortunately, Baum decided not to. We think it was a wrong decision. It was a bad decision. Lindsay Miani, uh, Lindani's wife, is very, very disappointed, uh, as are a lot of people in the community. Uh, but we are focused on uh, bringing some kind of justice through the civil lawsuit. Okay. Well, the footage from the Wang's Ring doorbell camera shows Mr. Miani had no intent. Honolulu Police Department had the footage within the time Miani was murdered. Why has the Honolulu Police Department false narrative of Mr. Biana um, propagated. All right. I'll well, I think we see in a lot of these police killings that there is a false narrative that is uh, propagated okay. from the very beginning. The information about what happened is within the possession of the police department here, you know, the Honolulu Police Department, it's in the possession of the Chicago Police Department, it's in the possession of the St. Louis Police Department, yet they control the narrative when they first announced a police shooting and a police killing. And we, we see it time and time again. There was an article out of some, some major, it might've been the Washington Post that just describes in detail how pervasive this, um, this practice is of assassinating uh, people of color and black people twice. You know, once physically they take their life and they do it again in, in trying to demonize them when really video and other things show that police were out of were out of step bound and they broke the law and they didn't follow policy in in killing people and it's um, it's a terrible terrible horrific thing that's happened I think we've shown through the doorbell footage uh, through through the unedited body camera footage and we'll continue to show through other facts as, as they're uncovered how innocent Lindani really was and how culpable the officers involved in his killing uh, were and are. Was Mr. Miani a victim of anti-Black tropes, uh, presumptions of guilt? I think so, absolutely. Um, you know, you see his demeanor when he approaches the house, he takes, he removes his shoes, he's wearing a traditional Zulu uh, headdress as if he's going somewhere to to um, seek some sort of spirituality. He apologized repeatedly. And still, um, you know, you have assumptions by, by the Wangs and you have officers showing up using unlawful threat of force and unlawful force against an unarmed man 
who is not harming anyone whatsoever. So absolutely, I do think that there, there was racism involved and that this would not have happened if he looked differently. If he weren't black, he would have been treated a lot differently. Why were the names of the officers not revealed? And, and if they're so honorable, then step up. Uh, are they fearful due to the revealed footage of the Wayne's fear? Well, I think HPD, like other police departments, tend to want to protect their own. I mean, they act like they're in a tribe that's above the law and that's above uh, civilian society, so to speak. And so I think there was a desire to conceal their identities um, to protect them. But we have identified two of the officers. We have named them in the lawsuit. And we, we will be uncovering the identity of the third officer and uh, adding him into the lawsuit as well. You know, one of the officers, and I don't know how widely this has been discussed in the community as of yet, but he was involved in a hit and run uh, drunk driving accident back in 2016. And uh, he was not reprimanded. He, he had an administrative proceeding and had, had his license, his driver's license revoked. But he was let off because no witnesses would come and testify. And he was out there on April 14th of this year and uh, armed and is responsible for the killing of Mr. Miani. And it's, it's just atrocious how officers are not, are not reprimanded, um, you know, let alone charged for their crimes. Yeah. Well, you know, Andre... Um, you're a civil rights attorney here in uh, Hawaii. Is there anything people of color can do to protect themselves from biased killer cops? You have to be diplomatic. You know, you have to be diplomatic. You do have a right to record um, what's going on. The First Amendment um, is a constitutional right. But the thing really is that the number of people in the community, um, black people, yellow people, white people, people of all colors and um, combinations are speaking out against uh, police brutality in, in Honolulu. Um, we brought a, a couple of pictures of, of that, and a lot of that had to do with the gross murder of George Floyd um, and the question of uh, Derek which has brought a new in America. While the police officers who killed Lindani Miani have not been charged, the officers um, who killed, I remember, Skycap uh, have been charged. And is a watershed insofar as that's the first time in 40 years that uh, police officers have been charged with any um, killing in Honolulu. And so I think that that is a reflection of the community uh, demanding uh, accountability. Yeah, you, you know, back to you, Bridget. Mr. Miani apologized to the Wangs for mistaking their home for the temple next door. So why did they call the police after the fact? Well, you know, we're, we're not sure, and, and we do suspect that he thought that he was at a temple. Uh, either way, he was mistaken, and he apologized. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And I think the bottom line is that it doesn't really matter in the end. What matters is how the officers approached him and that they didn't even give him the respect, the decency, or the legal, you know, announcement of who they were. And they refused to do it when he specifically asked them, who are you? Over and over and over. And I think that the focus really does need to remain on the officers. I think uh, there are many problems with the, with the Wangs and their conduct and how they approach the situation. But, you know, we're a society of a lot of different people from a lot of different places. They weren't from here. They were, they were tourists. This was his home. And officers have to be able to approach people. If you're going to approach someone at night, announce yourself. There's plenty of common law 
that establishes that that is the law. You cannot approach someone at night with a gun and make a command to get on the ground without announcing that you're an officer and stating your purpose. And when it comes down to it, that is what they did wrong. He had all right to defend himself because as far as he knew, they were unarmed thugs who who were there, you know, they were her, they were um, Sabine Wang's buddies for all he knew. And until they announced themselves as officers, he had a right to defend himself. Yeah, this is the Aloha State. You know, has the state, Bridget, downplayed this case to say it's Aloha message for tourism? Because the city is packed here. Hawaii is packed with tourists. I think so. I think that's part of the problem. I think um, there's just a general sort of complacency against uh, things like this, and it's very unfortunate. I think a lot of people want to believe that aloha pervades every single aspect of the society when it doesn't exist for all people who live here. Uh, so I think it's a it's a mix of of several different things, and it is packed. It's more packed than I have seen it in the last 15 years. Um, and I, I do think that if people knew that this happened, if people from the mainland knew that this happened to Mr. Miani, uh, they might think twice about coming here and they, they might have some conversations about, well, maybe we should go somewhere else. Maybe we shouldn't give our money to a state that is going to refuse to do something about this. I like that. Andre, you wanted to chime in before Sequoia comes in? No, just it was clear to me that the manner in which the police officers approached Mr. Mayani was totally unprofessional. I do indeed uh, believe was illegal. Police officers are supposed to declare themselves and state why they want to talk to somebody. Um, in this particular case, I mean, we have a hysterical uh, woman in the house, but Mr. Mayani still wasn't suspected of any crimes. I mean, you know, Wandering into a house uh, and leaving after you've been asked uh, to do so um, is not trespassing. Um, you have to remain after they tell you to leave in order for a crime to be committed. So the manner in which the police officers approached Mr. Mayani was uh, totally unprofessional to say the least and totally unrealistically threatening to Mr. Mayani. When you tell somebody to get down on the ground, you're telling them to um, be helpless, to telling them to surrender when in fact he had not committed a crime. They should have asked to talk to him and want to say we want to talk to you about what happened here and not get down on the ground treating him like he was a non-person, a non-citizen, or a person who had no rights. Yeah, you know, moving on to talk about um, critical race theory, critics say opponents of critical race theory are purposely distorting its true meaning. So Sequoia, why are opponents reacting to CRT with intense rage? Well, first of all, we have to see this as last this effort with their lost cause, right? This is an agenda. This is all about the elections that are coming up in 2022 to 24. Uh, we're not going to fall for the, the, the obi doke okay? This is not an issue. We know what CRT is. We know that at the graduate level, I'm not going to go into what it is, but what it is not is a way to uh, some kind of agenda to scare white people, like look out the boogeyman, the black people are coming to get you. This has nothing to do with this. This is all about uh, deflecting us from real true issues. We need to work on our voter suppression, fight about that. We need to work about the, against the police brutality. We need to still get through this dang pandemic. So this is just all a non-issue for people who don't read uh, you know, you got your hillbilly hordes who want to take this and run with it and terrorize school boards. This has nothing to do with that. Um, what we need to do is to keep on doing what we do and empowering our children. We know that the result of this, we've seen this before, there will be a lot of backlash, be it teachers or students who will uh harass and bully our children in the classroom. Um, they didn't care when they're bullying or creating uh, modules that uh, 
create like math problems around if you pick so many barrels of cotton, how many blah, 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 right? But we got to center white kids, they're being hurt, right? But it's okay to bully and mess with our children, right? So, you know, there was recently a case uh, in high school where kids had a slave auction of their fellow students in the class, you know, in their high school. No one was calling about MLK and I have a dream on that. But what's interesting, the irony of it all, Texas is the lead on this, right? They do our textbooks, all of this. Um, so they push the CRT baloney. Then they have these parents pulling up these, I have a dream, MLK, judged by character, not color. And then what do they take out? of the curriculum. There's no MLK, there's no Frederick Douglass, there's no Indian Inclusion Act, there's no talking about the labor of Cesar Chavez. Chavez. So they are attacking people of color. There's nowhere in that legislation about CRT. So this is the uh, this is the deflection. It's all about breaking down, not putting our history in the books that should be there to show everyone's history. Um, so we need to just push through this and keep empowering our children um, with various organizations like uh, FacingHistory.org. We've got um, BrownMamas.org. We've got MamaTrotter.org. We have Sisters Empowering Hawaii. Um, I am launching a YouTube channel on August 4th. Um, it's called uh, Kid Power. And it's all about books that help to empower and tell our history. We don't need to put it in these uh, public school systems because we need to keep going and showing up and progressing. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Andre, I Andre. I say, I mean, America afraid of its own history for the longest time. I mean, and they've been afraid of the history of the true world. I mean, when you go back to the 1800s, the laws to black people to read, the laws that made it illegal to educate people, this made it easy to oppress people. This made it easy to ignore the humanity of people. Um, boy, um, critical race theory is a college level class and you can analyze the functions of government and various institutions by the way in which they affect negatively or positively different races. That's not taught in grammar school. That's not taught in high school. People are fighting the teaching of a fuller um, version of American history. You need to read Lerone Bennett. They came before the Mayflower. You need to read Howard Zinn's The People's History of America. Um, we've been in America um, for 200 years, and it goes through ebbs and flows. When I was a junior in college, um, as the Black Student Union, and I was vice president of the over the administration building and demanded that they give us a Black a studies program, which they did, and we graduated and moved on um, the Black Studies program lasted uh, about six years, and they uh, disbanded it um, because there weren't enough Black students there to continue to fight for it. So what we're seeing here now, I believe, is, is a phase. It's just a phase in the battle to fully... And it keeps on going. Texas and California are the two largest states that buy school textbooks. And that's where the battle is, Texas being that conservative state that doesn't want to have actual uh, educators on its textbooks board. They preachers and politicians. Um, and these are the people that want to eliminate uh, the important historical lessons uh, that, that can be taught. I mean, the Declaration of Independence, everybody talks about uh, Jefferson. Uh, there's there, which slavery and uh, accused King of England of forcing slavery upon Americans. And, and Jefferson, as we know, he owned about 500 slaves and had his favorite, uh, Sally Hemings, who bore him six kids. Um, but even he understood that there would be a price to be paid for um, the slavery and the, which was 
in existence. I mean, you can't have a slave system without violence and murder, period. Well, you know, Bridget and Sequoia, what resources may we draw from to protect our children and community from inversive and hateful behaviors? Bridget. Well, from my perspective, um, call me up. <laughs> I don't know if that incident that Sequoia mentioned about, uh, you know, offering students a slave who's your classmate. I'm not familiar with that, but if that happened here in Hawaii, call me. <laughs> that should not go without being checked and being challenged. Um, other things that happen to people in the workplace, uh, in the park, in public places, and in, in accommodations, anywhere. If you feel that you've been wronged as a child, if, if you're a parent and you have a child and you feel that they've been wronged at school because of their race or their ethnicity or their status that's, that's protected under the law, call me, call another attorney, and we will help you. Um, it, the, the more that people assert their rights and, um, you know, don't allow these things to continue to happen or make someone pay when they happen or make someone, you know, get a criminal charge and spend jail time when things like this happen, it, it'll be a deterrent. It will. Until we reach into people's pockets and until we force people to, um, to go to jail, if they're breaking the law, they're going to continue to do it. So from my perspective, uh, the legal system is, is you know, a, is a true mechanism to affect change. Well, that's comforting to know, you to contact, you know, an attorney and that you'll take on these cases. And, and moving on, Sequoia, let's talk about voter suppression. Has voter suppression happened in the past? Oh, yeah, just real quick. Uh, that case uh, was in Alito, Texas, the high school that held a, a slave trading game. Um, so that was April of this year, April 13th, that, that uh, news came out. Uh, just horrific. Um, all kinds of cases of teachers on Zoom when we were under the pandemic, uh, getting caught with their mic on, saying horrible things about our students. So this is going on, this is real. What um, state is it, uh, Sequoia? It's Alito, Texas. Okay. A-L-T-O. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, but, uh, and we have to follow the money on this CRT. This is like Heritage Foundation, um, Prager U, uh, American Legislators, Legislative Exchange Council, Alec Koch Brothers, big money in this, big money in hate. This is all about the election. This is just a deflection. So they don't want us to know our history, but we don't need people. We don't need to justify who we are as the people in our history. We know our history. And we don't need to have uh, constructed white people trying to, tell us how we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live. Um, so back to the voter suppression. Um, yeah, this is all connected, these justice discrepancies, right? So we have uh, our John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act coming down the line. Uh, we really need to start uh, checking again, making sure that you are registered uh, through vote.org. StaceyAbramsFairFight.com. Make sure you're not being purged. There's all kind of, um, you've got it, our Voting Rights Act of 1965, right? So all these different restrictions to prevent states from doing um, these Jim Crow era style ways of suppressing us and keeping us from voting. And it's not just people of color, it's also people with disabilities that are along this line. So basically what happens to us will happen to everyone else. We are the canaries in the coal mine with this. They see that our vote, black votes matter. And um, that's another organization, by the way, we should check out, our viewers should check out. And uh, we are on it though. We know what they're doing. They know that our power uh, is very strong and they're trying to keep us away from the polls, but it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And Andre, I wanna come to you uh, about you know our voter suppression. What is at stake if these oppressive bills are passed? Okay, they're designed, those bills are designed to chip away at the large victory that um, people of good conscience have been able to mount in some states 
very ultra close. Um, but it also comes down to making it more difficult and um, making it um, increasingly impossible um, for people to vote. I'm same old thing of the poll tax or the uh, alphabet tax or count how many marbles are in this nug. It's just, you know, a new trick um, in a new day. Um, the cure for it really is to put enough pressure, it seems to be on Joe Manson these days, to adjust the filibuster to protect the right of our nation to vote. I mean, a national holiday just to vote would be a big improvement. You know, because so many people have to work to vote, you know, and if you didn't have that, that would be a big improvement. Other improvements, I mean, it should be easy for people. The fact that Republicans, harder people to vote, should give people an idea that their message may not be found. In fact, it may be totally incorrect and, and based upon totally fictitious facts. Um, but anybody who wants to um, win by illegal means, I mean, it's not unusual and it has to be met uh, with power. All right. So, Bridget, you know, I, I, what actions are needed to protect our civil rights? Well, I think um, there are a lot of different ways that we can come at this. A very disappointing thing that, that's happened in the last year was that I think eight or nine bills uh, having to do with, you know, like the Breonna Taylor, the no knock warrant, there was legislation that just didn't pass. It was all shot down by our, by our state legislatures. And that's, it's, it's, it's just unacceptable. We have to put more pressure on them because those civil rights do exist. And if, if, our, if our House and our Senate are unwilling to codify those rights, you know, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's a start. And as I mentioned, another vehicle is the justice system and taking things through the court, bringing claims against individuals and institutions that display systemic racism and that and refuse to and to uh, abide by and uh, allow people their civil rights. Yeah, well, in closing, uh, you know, a minute for you, uh, Sequoia, and a minute for um, Andre, you know, CRT is a key wedge issue in cultural divide. One minute closing Sequoia and Andre, please take us out. Okay, let's keep our eyes on the prize, beautiful people. You know, don't let these deflections, emotional topics, these issues, so-called issues, uh, deflect you from what we need to do. Uh, follow the money, alecexposed.org, A-L-E-C, exposed.org, will give you all the information you need to know about who the players are in terms of our legislators and corporations who do these performative acts of pretending like they care about us and our issues, but yet vote, get our legislators to vote against those said issues. Um, just keep on um, empowering yourself and your community and your children, and we'll be fine, and we will reach that promised land. All right, and Andre, in 30 seconds or less. Five young people have picked up the mantle of the protest and the drive for freedom and motivated and very all the young people who are getting involved and picking up um, the mantle of freedom. I mean, our generation of the so-called 60s, I mean, when you came through college and you had to know how to uh, turn a joint out, basically. Because yeah. that was the power, the power of the right or the power of the threat of the right. And as a result, there were more scholarships and more Black people to these um, than there are, I think, uh, these days. Mm. Well, thank you, Andre. Uh, um, more oh. on crime and all that stuff. Well, Bridget, Sequoia, and Andre, thank you for your wisdom. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. This is Sister Parha. Aloha.